second half, we have uh, Lucas Cavanaugh and Jesse Lupini. Um, they uh, together are avocado video. Um, yeah, good. Sorry, let's applaud for that. want to be called by his name, so it's great that he's taking charge of the audience now. Um, so they do uh, science communication and video storytelling, and their talk is called Experiments in Digital Scientific Storytelling. Um, and their origin story is that uh, nine years ago, they started working together as teachers at a science camp that they also attended together as children. <laughs> Thanks, Larissa. How's it going, everyone? Good. There's a projector in my face. See, that was organic. It was organic the first time, too. <laughs> sure. This is a little less organic. Take your microphone. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, so thanks so much for the intro. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm Jesse. You are booming. <laughs> I'm very loud. I'm Jesse, yeah. Um, and we have a company called Avocado Video. Uh, we are a science communication and video slash now podcast and written, and we do a lot of things now, um, production firm here in Vancouver. Um, so thanks so much for inviting us to talk. I, t tonight has been awesome because we've seen uh, a bunch of people who have uh, perfected uh, a medium and have become true like experts in their field and at their craft. And I want to start off our talk by saying that that is not us. <laughs> we, we don't do that at all. We are like the ultimate generalists. So every project we work on, we are not experts at anything we do, but we do our best to try and, um, A, understand how the general public, who are also not experts in a lot of things, see the world, and, and B, we try and learn as much as we can about the, the topics that we're studying and communicating about. Right, so uh, today uh, we're just gonna show you a few of the things we've done and a few of the strategies we've employed uh, to tell scientific stories, um, which is probably, better described as, instead of experiments in digital scientific storytelling, uh, times we've made audio video things that people have liked or learned things from and lessons we've learned making those things. Which is of course a terrible way to communicate that. So uh, instead we're gonna go with tricking people into learning things. <laughs> which is really what we like to do. Cool. Um, so the first one we're gonna talk about, uh, essentially our, our company is divided into two halves. Um, half that people can hire us to make things for them, people who have scientific messages, uh, and half is uh, us sort of uh, being more driven by a creative side of things, uh, making documentary projects, educational things that we just believe are important and want to put up out of the world. So that's mostly what we're going to talk about today. Um, one of the ones we made last summer is called The Rarest Drug on Earth. This is a 10-minute web documentary which was funded by uh, TELUS, Thank you, Talis. Um, <laughs> your internet fees go somewhere, to us apparently. Um, and essentially, uh, this is a really incredible story of an isotope called actinium-225, which has shown amazing uh, early results in German trials, uh, literally bringing back prostate cancer patients from the brink of death um, to a point of complete remission of their cancer, which is incredible. The problem is, on the entire planet Earth, there's about enough actinium-225 to treat a couple hundred people a year. Uh, so not even enough for a proper clinical trial. The solution to this uh, actually exists right here in Vancouver. Uh, it's a facility called Triumph, which is a 50-year-old particle accelerator um, underneath the University of British Columbia. And uh, we essentially heard about this story and felt it was a story that needed to be told. So we made this documentary. Uh, we've got a short clip from it to show you. Um, the time we learned about this, we, we attended a lecture, which was about 45 minutes, and went into the details of like Triumph's production plan for this isotope. Uh, and we needed, in this 10 minute web doc, to take those 45 minutes and condense them down to one minute. Um, so we used some animation, we used some very creative storytelling, and we came up with this minute of film, which we're about to show you. Enjoy just aren't many places in the world where you could make actinium-225 with this method. Fortunately, uh, Triumph is one of them. At the end of the aisle there, you can see the yellow tower, and that's where the actinium is made. This is the beam dump, a huge block of aluminum that safely absorbs the leftover proton beam. 
When Triumph was designed 50 years ago, the idea of targeted alpha therapy hadn't crossed anyone's mind. Really, it was quite coincidental. Paul came back to Triumph and he said he happened to be walking by a group of our accelerator engineers and they kind of caught his eye because he had a spreadsheet that was spread out in front of them that was filled with all of this data. And Paul said, well, what is that? And they said, uh, oh, well, you know, this is, this is what's in the beam dump. And Paul said, is there an actinium in there? And they said, oh, yeah, lots. <laughs> To make actinium, we irradiate a piece of thorium metal with trillions of protons. When that proton hits the thorium nucleus, we are blasting it apart into pretty much every element or isotope lighter than thorium. The alchemy is what I like to call it, where we convert one element into another on a particle accelerator. So that's what we do. We take a 45 minute lecture and put it into one minute of film or similar ratios like that. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the first sample of work we wanted to show you. Um, it came out a year ago. You can watch it for free online uh, at raristdrug.com, or uh, if you have TELUS Video On Demand, apparently it's there too. Um, it, it, it was pretty successful. The National Post covered it. Um, Daily Hive covered it in a bunch of markets, and we've, uh, we've got fingers crossed on making a longer feature version, which includes a little more about um, uh, actually the patients who are receiving this uh, treatment. That's project number one. I think it's maybe less booming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, this was a talk that uh, happened at Science World last year at the uh, OmniMax Theater, which is such a cool theater. Um, and we were uh, approached by Triumph again, another time we got to work with them, um, to help uh, Dr. Stanley Yen, who was the presenting researcher, uh, work on his presentation um, to make it a little bit more understandable to the general public and a little bit more appealing for a wider audience who maybe were not used to university lectures. So I'm gonna show you um, what Stan's original presentation looked like, at least a little piece of it, and, ex and I'll sort of talk along with it the way he explained it to us when we first went to Triumph. Uh, this is just a piece of it in the middle. So uh, supernova core collapse is where neutrinos come from. And this is the Crab Nebula, which is um, what's left over of a supernova from 1054. It was visible in broad daylight for several weeks. And that's the next one's probably Beetlejuice. So we, uh, we saw Stan deliver his presentation. And I want to preface this by saying Stanley Yen is like way smarter than I could ever hope to be. Um, but his presentation is something that he'd been working on and like adding to for a long time, but he hadn't updated it from scratch in a long time. And he was gonna be delivering this lecture to a group of people who probably included a lot of folks who did not study science and maybe didn't even follow it really regularly. So we needed to turn this into more of a story and less of a university lecture. So this idea, we're not gonna show you any of the like neutrino stuff in this case, we're just gonna talk about this idea of this you know, next core collapse supernova thing. We turned this idea into the structure of the whole um, of the whole presentation. So at the start of it, before we got into the science, before we got into neutrinos or how they work, or how these particles work or what they are, we introduced the idea of guest stars. And guest stars have been seen throughout human history in the sky. Uh, there's evidence for them in, in ancient writings and on cave walls with, with cave paintings. And there are these stars that appeared briefly and they burned for sometimes up to a year in the sky, and they were a new star that had never been seen before, and then at some point, they went out, never to be seen again. So, this is what the sky would have looked like in Vancouver in uh, October 23rd, 1054. So there's Orion there, and you can see above it, this star that was not there before, shining brighter than anything else in the sky. It would have been absolutely stunning to see in real life. And, and ancient peoples from this time recorded this, and, and we can see the evidence of that today. So we open the presentation with this mystery, this thing for the audience to, to hold on to and remember and think about. And after talking about neutrinos a little bit, we kind of left this. We didn't connect the dots immediately. We talked about how they worked and what they are. Um, and then we came back to it later in the presentation after explaining that neutrinos are released uh, when stars go supernova. We came back to this guest star of 1054 and we showed how it was, in fact, a star going supernova. That's what these guest stars are. And what it is now today, we had some music and sound over this. <laughs> Lucas actually DJed the presentation live. 
I'm, I'm not kidding. It was great. And so here it is. It's now the Crab Nebula, which is one of the most photographed objects in the sky. Uh, it's gorgeous. You've probably all seen it before at some point. And so this was a cool way of like creating a mystery for the audience that they understood, not just throwing a bunch of scientific information at them. And then as we built up the sort of knowledge and understanding, we ended up here at, again, this thing that people recognize and understand. And I think it really helps a lot of people connect with it. And then at the very end of the presentation, after a little more information, we came back to this idea one more time. Because we're right now waiting for the next supernova. And uh, there's Orion. And there's Betelgeuse up on Orion's shoulder. And this is the most likely candidate for the next supernova. This is probably the one that's visible in our sky that we think is going to go nova next. So sometime between now and 50,000 years from now, we'll see this in the sky. Might not look exactly like this, but it'll be pretty stunning. And it'll burn for a while, for months probably. And then it'll go out forever. And it'll never be seen again in the way that it was before. It'll be a nebula. And that means that Orion's shoulder is gone. That constellation is going to change, and we think it looks a little bit like a Canada goose. <laughs> Just throwing it out there for the astronomers of the future. Uh, and this was the end of the presentation. So we, we, uh, there was a lot of science in the middle that I didn't talk about here. But we, we, we really created a bit of a narrative and a story for the audience to follow along with and, and explain how that science impacted ancient people and what they would have seen and then how it's going to affect humanity in the future, because, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not super optimistic right now considering what's going on in the world, but I hope we're around to see this happen. Uh, yeah, we had a great time. We want to do more projects like this. Cool. A um, couple brief projects at the end, uh, just to cover quickly. We're doing our favorite time? All right, awesome. Um, the thing we're probably best known for, um, it does not traditionally fall under the guise of science communication or art, uh, it's political videos, uh, which we make a lot of around uh, each election. Uh, we made one for the last BC election. We made one for the electoral reform referendum last year. We're going to make one again, uh, or maybe multiple ones, uh, for the upcoming federal election. Um, we just wanted to talk about these briefly because we're really passionate about them and we believe they are a form of science communication and art. Um, they're science communication because uh, the idea behind these is we give people a simple tool to quickly educate themselves on a series of issues in sort of four to five minutes. Like very dense, information rich. So that if you are interested in a particular thing, you can grab that little piece of information out of the video. Um, and we hope that that sparks critical thinking and uh, engagement in things that affects everyone. The other thing is we believe that art is meant to evoke a reaction and engage people. And of all the things we've done, this has done the most of that. Um, so each of these videos uh, received sort of about 600,000 uh, views in the province of BC uh, and uh, about 15% of people um, uh, engaged with them in some way. So we were pretty proud of that and we want to we wanna do more of that. Yeah, that 15% that engagement rate, like that's really high for, for web videos. Normally you have, what is it, Lucas? Uh, like, it's about 0.25. Yeah, normally like a, a YouTube video or a web video, you have 0.25% of people actually engage with it in some way. And people were engaged with this. They were interested in it, they were commenting on it, they were talking about it, and that means people were using it and listening to it. And that was great for us to hear. Although a little bit scary that, I don't know, politics is, is its own kettle of fish. Okay, I won't get into that. Um, okay, last thing. So we are working on one of the Her Story videos for Curiosity Collider, which has been so, so cool, such a cool opportunity. Um, we're working with uh, Dr. Jessica Polarsik, who is an assistant professor and Canada research chair at SFU. She studies ancient tsunamis and how they occur and maybe how we might predict them in the future. Um, so we've been working on a video, interviewing her, learning about her work. It's been incredibly cool. And if you want to see that and the other ones that are being made, that's September 13th at the Orpheum Annex. So. Sorry, correction, it's at the Annex. I oh, was correct. It's a lie. Annex, not Orpheum Annex. It's, it's not that? the Orpheum Annex. It's not just the annex. The annex. the annex. No Orpheum. It's still behind the Orpheum though, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get off the stage after this. One more thing. We just have so many projects we're excited about. Um, we just launched a podcast. Uh, it's called Talking About Talking About Science. Um, it's just us talking. Um, so if you haven't enjoyed the last 10 minutes, probably don't listen to it. Um, but the idea is... Um, we think there's a lot of important uh, science-related stories in the media and public discourse, and we think more people need to be talking about them. So, first episode is now up. It's brand new. 
Uh, it's about natural health products in Canada um, and the surprising things you can say on them, uh, which is anything. You, you can say anything. <laughs> um, you can like you can you can make health claims about products. Uh, and advertise those claims on that product with absolutely no evidence that they do the thing that you're claiming, which is a little bit scary. So, um, talk about sign.com if you want to subscribe and listen to that. With that, thank you so much. Uh, that's, that's our talk.